We now jump across the Atlantic Ocean, well, across the continent of North America, and then across the Atlantic Ocean from San Francisco to London to talk about the psychedelic scene that was developing there. And there are so many parallels um, and parallels and differences that the compare and contrast discussion with this is, I think, really quite fascinating. Uh, uh, I, the, for the first period up to 1967, we'll get the same kind of thing in London, that is mainstream groups of music that we, that we know um, that, that makes the charts, that, that, that gets distributed pretty widely, and then groups that really sort of stay within the London uh, subculture. And so there is a subculture going on in London starting already in 1965, just like in San Francisco, uh, and then breaking out in 1967. Some of the groups break out nationally, break out into the United States and have success. Some don't, and we'll talk about that as we go. What's interesting about the British take on psychedelia is that British, the, British who, um, the British people who developed the psychedelic scene in London only had limited information about what was going on in San Francisco. We have to remember back in 1965, 1966, the air travel was much less frequent and available uh, than it is today. There weren't a lot of people that had gone back and forth between San Francisco and London, especially young people, only sort of 20, 21 years old, not enough life experience for that to have been part of it yet. And so really what you knew about San Francisco was really something that somebody might have told you or, or something that had uh, appeared somehow in a newspaper, remembering that there aren't actually a lot of sort of youth-oriented newspapers, certainly no television shows, there was no internet, there was no cable TV. I mean, how would you find out about it? So what's interesting is with the information they had, they developed a psychedelic culture that has all the basic sort of features of the San Francisco one, but a very different kind of uh, English accent that goes uh, with it. So and that comes from the fact that there wasn't a lot of direct contact. Some people had been back and forth, uh, but, uh, but not a lot. One guy who had been back and forth was uh, Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet. And we should say about the San Francisco scene that uh, it, it arose, of course, in the same place where beat culture had arisen around the City Lights uh, bookstore and people like Lawrence Ferlinghetti uh, and, and sort of uh, this had happened in the late 50s. Of course, in, within the beat culture, the music of choice was jazz and not rock and roll. Allen Ginsberg, however, uh, was very interested in helping promote not only poetry, beat poetry, but also the idea that LSD could be a, a way to higher consciousness and more poetic awareness. And so in the summer of 1965, he comes to London and helps to organize a poetry reading uh, kind of thing, brings a bit of the San Francisco uh, thing to London. They put this, this event together called Poets of the World, Poets of Our Time in the Royal Albert Hall in the summer of 1965. And a lot of historians would say that really sort of marks the beginning of the psychedelic underground in London. When that happens, a lot of people who've been to San Francisco and know what's going on sort of share a bit of what they know. Um, by the fall of 1965, a guy by the name of Michael Hollinshead opened something called the World Psychedelic Center, and his job really is to be like Ken Kesey was in San Francisco, the kind of Johnny Appleseed of LSD and the whole kind of counterculture kind of experience, and it sort of becomes the center for uh, psychedelia uh, in London. Again, very much an underground kind of thing. So that opens in the fall of 65. In February of 1966, the Indica Bookshop opens up. Now that's a bookshop that's devoted to a lot of these kind of culture, cultural kinds of books and, uh, and literature. The Indica Bookshop is the bookshop that John Lennon goes into to get his copy of Timothy Leary's The Psychedelic Experience, which ends up being quoted to a certain extent in Tomorrow Never Knows, which had been recorded at just about that time, early 1966. So Indica Bookstore is open in February of 1966. The London Free School, a school devoted to the idea of people being able to take classes for free to help help raise their awareness of various kind of social, social and culture, but also pragmatic kinds of issues and topics. Uh, that opens in March of 66. The International Times, which is kind of their version of the Oracle or later Rolling Stone magazine, a magazine devoted to some of these kinds of things, uh, uh, starts to be published in October of 1966. And in December of 1966, uh, the UFO Club or UFO Club uh, uh, events start to happen where uh, evenings are planned around psychedelic uh, kinds of things. Now we're talking about all talking about things that happened in 1966 within the psychedelic underground in London. By way of contrast, it's important to, to, to note that in April of 1966, there was a Time magazine cover story 
about swinging London. So the idea is that if you went to London in 1966, you were going to get kind of mod London. I mean, you were going to get the, 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 the kind of London that uh, Austin Powers kind of makes fun of, right? That's not quite yet hippie London, right? That's sort of Carnaby Street sort of... Um, uh, mod uh, mod style. That's what was happening on the mainstream. While that was happening, and while Time Magazine was trumpeting it to Americans who were maybe thinking about a vacation in London at the same time, they would go to London at the same time in places they weren't going. This psychedelic scene was developing. So that's uh, in many ways what we mean by subculture being out of the mainstream. Uh, some of the underground favorites of the psychedelic scene were a group called the Pink Floyd, that was the original version of Pink Floyd, led by Sid Barrett. Uh, they had two early singles that were uh, important in the UK. The Pink Floyd, led by Sid Barrett, never had any success in this country. They came to this country, they toured a bit, but they never really were the Pink Floyd we know from 1973, the dark side of the moon Pink Floyd with David Gilmore on lead guitar. This is a very different, in many ways, sort of markedly psychedelic group. Early singles were Arnold Lane, which was a number 20 hit in the UK, and See Emily Play, which was a number six hit in the UK. But Pink Floyd were interesting in that they refused to play those singles live. Even though they had singles in the UK, when they would play these shows, they would do these like jam improv things, right? And um, this, uh, this, uh, frustrated many of the patrons that came to see them at the shows because they would up, be up there sort of doing an avant-garde improvisation thing for 15 20, min 15, 20 minutes, maybe up to a half hour. They wanted to hear the hit songs, and so they're all stories of people, you know, pouring beer on the band from the balcony and this kind of thing, but they wouldn't relent because they thought, you know, sing radio singles and live performance were two different things and they should not, uh, they should not mix. A good example of, of this sort of improvisational approach is a track called Interstellar Overdrive. Uh, which is uh, after it sort of begins, uh, the tune begins, they go into a kind of a live improvisation. Uh, it's very sort of avant-garde. The track actually appears on the, uh, their first album from August 1967, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. The song Interstellar Overdrive is interesting because it helps us sort of see how things that sort of partially digested uh, stuff from America sort of made their way into the London psychedelic scene. The tune itself the opening lick of it, of Interstellar Overdrive, was based on the lick of um, a, a, a Los Angeles group by the name of Love, led by Arthur Lee. In 1966, they'd had a hit called My Little Red Book. Well, it was a modest hit, but it was a hit nonetheless. Um, and My Little Red Book is a song that was originally written by Burt Bacharach and Hal David right, of sort of mainstream uh, pop fame. Uh, but their manager, Pink Floyd's manager, Peter Jenner, had heard the tune, but he didn't actually have a copy of it. And so he started humming the initial lick to Sid Barrett, or Sid Barrett, who didn't quite get it right. The lick he used is the one that became Interstellar Overdrive. So if you have a chance, you should go check out the beginning of Love's My Little Red Book and compare it with the beginning of Interstellar Overdrive, and you'll hear the similarity between those two licks. They don't get quite right because they haven't got the recording. They've never heard Love play it at all, and so they just kind of get this imperfect vocal rendition of it, which becomes an entirely different tune. It's almost in many ways symbolic of the differences between the, the West Coast American and the London psychedelic scene. Um, of course, the story with, uh, with Pink Floyd, um, they recorded Piper at the Gates of Dawn in the same summer in 1967 at Abbey Road Studios, where the Beatles are recording stories about Paul McCartney poking his head in and sort of hearing what these, this young group just making their first album uh, were up to. Uh, but Sid uh, starts to really uh, show real signs of mental instability. Maybe it was the acid. Maybe it was that he was going to be mentally unstable anyway. But the combination of the two probably wasn't a good thing. Um, and he started to act increasingly erratic. His buddy, David Gilmore, comes in first to kind of be in the band with Sid to kind of cover for him, but then they just decide one day not to pick Sid up for a gig, and the band David Gilmore essentially replaces Sid uh, in the group. They go on to have some great albums, but w really with in, in, in albums that are really successful in the UK. Saucer Full of Secrets from 1968 was a big one for them. Adam Hart Mother from 1970. But they don't really have, Pink Floyd doesn't really have their first important US success until Dark Side of the Moon from 1973, but boy, what a success that was. In many ways, Dark Side of the Moon, more than any other record that we can think of from the 70s, effectively takes the psychedelic aesthetic 
of what was happening in London during this late 60s and brings it into the 70s in maybe its most full-formed way, certainly a concept album. As we think about Pink Floyd through the 70s, we could almost say that The Wall uh, from 1979 is really sort of the last big concept album. So in many ways, we could tell the story of the, Sar of, of the concept album from Sgt. Pepper to The Wall uh, in, in many kinds of ways. Some of the other important groups uh, that were important in the underground scene. Again, Pink Floyd being a local group in London, never having international success. Some of the other groups that, had, uh, that, that were part of the scene were a group called the Soft Machine, uh, which brought together a very strong jazz influence uh, with psychedelia. A group called Tomorrow, they had one big hit, a um, uh, couple big hits, but the one big hit that I usually noticed for is something called My, Little, uh, My, uh, My White Bicycle. Interesting. Steve Howe, who would later be in the, the group Yes and then later Asia, uh, was in uh, Tomorrow. And the crazy world of Arthur Brown, who had a song called Fire, that got a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty good airplay and was later in the 70s played on American radio a lot, had Carl Palmer of Emerson Lincoln Palmer in the group. Well, we've talked about the London psychedelic scene and the groups that were sort of off the radar, the subculture groups that were part of that, uh, some of the groups that we certainly would have known about in this country, and maybe people wouldn't have really known about their concert events uh, unless they'd been in London. Now, in the next video, let's turn to a consideration of the mainstream stars in Britain and what was going on uh, that was definitely on the radar that plugs into this idea of psychedelic music coming out of the UK in the late 1960s.